My name is Deborah Humphreys, and I'm the Vice President for Policy and Public Engagement at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And I am so pleased to welcome you this morning to this Employer Educator Compact event. Uh, this is a forum on making high quality learning our priority as Americans go to college. And this event is being sponsored as part of AACNU's centennial initiative known uh, in the higher ed world as the LEAP Initiative, Liberal Education and America's Promise. And I want to welcome both uh, those of you here in Washington, D.C., and also those of you tuning in via our webcast uh, of the event that is online. I especially want to thank those of you in Washington, D.C., who made your way through traffic and hordes of tourists and police activity and street closures and all kinds of things. It's a very busy day in Washington, um, and the cherry blossoms, I understand, are bursting as we speak. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, there'll be time this afternoon. You can go and, and see them. Uh, for those of you who are viewing uh, online, I do want to note that all the various handouts that we might be referring to uh, and that the participants in the room have in hard copy are also posted to AACNU's website, aacu.org. Uh, including the biographies of the various um, leaders who will be speaking at the event today and whose perspectives we'll be sharing. Those of you who are interested in either tweeting or following a, a Twitter um, feed, we are using the hashtag uh, Leap Compact, uh, Leap Capital, L-E-A-P, Compact. So I'm going to just say a few words of introduction and then uh, turn the mic over to our president. So as part of the AACNU's LEAP initiative, which was launched in 2005, we have been working with our 1,300 college and university member institutions to challenge our nation's um, traditional practice of providing to only some students the advantages that come with an engaged and practical 21st century liberal education. Through LEAP, Hundreds of campuses and several large state systems are making far-reaching educational changes to help all their students, whatever their chosen major field of study, achieve a set of essential learning outcomes fostered through an engaged liberal education. You can find out more about the LEAP initiative and its many strands of work and its, its many resources to help you with these efforts if you are on campus at aacu.org LEAP. And for those of you here, we have put, get, provided to you an introduction to LEAP brochure, which gives you all the details of it. For those of you viewing online, if you are new to LEAP, you can find an introduction to LEAP slideshow on, on our website. So one part of the, the LEAP initiative is our LEAP President's Trust, 100 plus leading college, community college and university presidents, some of whom are with us today and all of whom are committed to advancing the goals of the LEAP initiative and who are using their own positions to advocate for this vision with their students and with those outside the academy who are wondering what a quality college education really is all about in the 21st century. The LEAP President's Trust is the group that has helped us to develop our new LEAP Employer Educator Compact that we'll be hearing about this morning. In addition, many of you know that through the entire history of the LEAP initiative, we have consistently sought the advice and counsel of business and nonprofit leaders at organizations and companies who hire our college graduates, and who, even in these challenging economic times, are seeking to hire graduates with the full set of skills and abilities that will ensure their individual success and the success of those organizations and companies competing in our global economy. So as part of this effort, we've spoken directly to individual business leaders through focus groups and events like this one, and we have commissioned a series of national surveys. Those surveys, including the one whose findings we're releasing this morning, were conducted by Hart Research Associates. And I am very pleased to introduce to you Abigail Davenport, the Senior Vice President at Hart Research. Uh, Abigail has been with us from the beginning of the LEAP initiative, which, and she's um, been a brilliant partner to us and has helped us over the entire course of the LEAP initiative to understand what the, the nation's employers are really looking for. Um, and she's going to provide an overview of the findings of our most recent survey, which was fielded online only a few months ago. So come on up.
Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to be with AAC and you again. Um, uh, as Deborah said, we conducted a survey of employers. We uh, wanted to understand employers' priorities when it comes to learning outcomes uh, for college graduates, and, and also understand their uh, sense of emerging educational practices and how well those prepare uh, graduates for success uh, in, in the workplace and in their careers. Um, so I'm going to take you through some key findings. I understand there could be questions. We have a limited amount of time and then there's going to be a panel, but there will be an opportunity for questions at some point, and I'm going to stick around if anyone does have questions. So just to tell you who we talked to, we conducted a survey online, a uh, national survey of employers. Um, these are executives at private sector and nonprofit organizations. So that includes CEOs, owners, directors, C-suite level executives, and vice presidents. Uh, and all individuals here said their company has at least 25 employees or more. We also wanted to make sure that we were talking to companies that have at least a proportion of their hires who are either graduates of two-year or four-year institutions. Um, so everyone said that 25% or more of their new hires have, have an associate's or a bachelor's degree. I just want to quickly highlight a few of the top level findings and then we'll sort of cover this as we go through. But innovation is a priority for employers. That is, there's no question about that. They're very focused on it and recognize innovation as key to the success of their companies. And when it comes to hiring uh, and hiring preferences, those candidates that have the abilities that will facilitate innovation are, are candidates that they give preference to. Um, they are clearly looking for those skills. There's also a real recognition of cross-cutting capacities and the importance of those. So the idea that <coughs> the major alone is what matters is not what these employees are, are telling us. They actually say that the skills of critical thinking, problem solving, and, and communication skills are actually more important than a candidate's major uh, when they are making hiring decisions. Um, so we see throughout this survey the importance of some of those cross-cutting skills and the priority that employees, employers are pace, placing on them. Um, that said, when asked what is most important for the success, the long-term success of an individual at their company, uh, the majority of employers are saying it's both broad knowledge and skills as well as specific or career or field-specific knowledge and skills. So the majority are saying that it's both that are important. Very few who say it is just uh, career-specific skills or the major that is most important for the success of an individual at their company in the long term. Uh, and what we also see is when we look at across several of the questions we ask, uh, employers place, placing a higher priority on practices that involve effortful, effortful and active work. Uh, the idea of applying skills and knowledge uh, and demonstrating the ability in real world settings uh, are things that really come up as priorities. Um, and we see that those outrank the acquisition of knowledge in several areas, uh, so that applying those skills in real world settings really is coming through in several ways as a high priority. And then we also just saw an interest in e-portfolios that are going to give employers more of a sense of a candidate's abilities beyond uh, the the resume and uh, their transcript. And we also have a question where we just want to understand what are employers doing today to partner with higher education institutions to facilitate this kind of real world learning um, that is so important to them. And we do find that a large proportion say that their companies uh, do engage in internship programs with local colleges. But there are other things they aren't doing, but there's a significant level of interest in getting involved in those ways. So that's just a key over level overview of findings. And I'm going to walk you through now the specific uh, findings that we have. So here, um, this is just kind of give you a little perspective on where employees are coming from. These are several statements, and the respondents were asked to what degree they agree or disagree with each of the statements. You can see there's agreement broadly with all of these statements. And if you look at the bottom one, you can see the challenges that employees are facing today are greater. And you can also see here that the expectations that employers have for them, their employees are greater. Uh, so the challenges are greater, the expectations are greater. As I mentioned before, innovation is central and key. Uh, we see here that um, innovation is essential to our company or organization's continued success. And then we see that 95% uh, say that their company puts a priority on hiring individuals 
with the intellectual and interpersonal skills that will help them contribute to innovation in the workplace. Uh, and I think it's important to note the second bar here. Uh, I referenced this earlier. But 93% of employers agree that a candidate's demonstrated capacity to think critically, communicate, communicate clearly, and solve complex problems is more important than their undergraduate major. 59% of employers strongly agree with that statement. And as you'll see throughout, uh, the kinds of skills and the kinds of cross-cutting skills and the application of knowledge uh, is illustrated in many ways. But this critical thinking, communication, and complex problem solving continuing to rise to the top in terms of their priorities. That said, uh, when we talk about uh, what, it, what is important for graduates, college graduates who want to pursue advancement and long-term career success at their companies, the majority, 55% of employers say having both field-specific knowledge and skills and broad range of skills and knowledge is important. So the both and, it's not really either or for the majority, it's both of these together. That said, it is worth noting this bar at the bottom. So among the employers we spoke to, only 16% said having knowledge and skills that apply to a specific field or position is more important to the continued uh, advancement and long-term career success of an individual. Uh, we wanted to get a sense of employers' feelings about higher education today, so we asked thinking about the economy overall, not just about their own companies, but thinking broadly to what, uh, how they feel the higher education system is doing in preparing graduates to succeed and contribute to this economy. You can see that 56% say that higher education is doing an excellent or a good job. Uh, I think what's worth noting here is that either side of the spectrum or the two ends of the spectrum, there are very few who are giving really strong marks, an excellent job is only 9%, and very few who are giving particularly harsh criticism, only 4% saying that, that higher education is doing a poor job. These employers are much more likely to be in the middle. The majority are positive uh, at good job or excellent job, but there are a significant 40% who, who say only a fair job. And this slide gives a sense of the degree to which <coughs> Employers feel that applicants are prepared both for success in entry-level positions and then success uh, as they advance and, and want to be promoted. And what you see is that employers do make a distinction here and they do express greater confidence in, in students being prepared for entry-level positions. Two-thirds say that all or most of the applicants for positions at their company in the past few years possess the full set of skills and knowledge needed for success in entry-level positions. That does drop notably to 44% when employers are talking about the skills and knowledge needed uh, to, for advancement and promotion within their company. So they are seeing a difference, but two-thirds saying when it comes to entering our companies, we feel all or most have the skills needed. We, in addition to some of the other skills that we uh, wanted to understand, we asked about a variety of others, and you can see that employers do value cross-cutting skills and qualities when they're hiring. Each of these is seen as important, a majority saying that they are at least fairly important. Uh, but you can see that there are some distinctions that employers are making when they're thinking about different kinds of skills that they feel are important for <coughs> success of their employees. And ethical judgment, 96% uh, saying that's at least fairly important, including 76 who saying that's very important. Uh, being comfortable working with people uh, from diverse cultural backgrounds, whether that's their colleagues, their clients, their customers, 96% important, very, very or fairly, including 63% very important. And then the ability to uh, con continue to de show development and the capacity for new learning, 94% very or fairly important, including 61% very important. So you see that the bars are a little longer for those of the ones at the top and the intensity there in terms of very important, you have 60% uh, or more saying that those three are very important. Now the other items here are seen as important by majorities, uh, but the intensity is, is a little less. Um, the, f the fourth item down, the interest, a candidate or, or an applicant's interest in giving back to the community in the local area in which the company serves, 71% say that's at least fairly important. 
And then sort of global knowledge, so knowledge about cultures, histories, values, religions, and social systems globally, 55% say that's at least fairly important. So you can see there are some distinctions and differentiation that employers are making in terms of the cross-cutting skills that are most important, but there really is quite a broad range that they feel is important for, uh, for college graduates to achieve. We asked employers about a variety of uh, learning outcomes, 17 in all, and we wanted to understand in which area, in each of these areas, do you think colleges should be placing more emphasis on this learning outcome, less emphasis, or do you think it should maintain the current level of emphasis? And the blue bar reflects the proportion who said uh, that employers should be placing more emphasis on this learning outcome. You can see here uh, all of these, these are the top nine, but 11 of the 17 majority said that they think colleges should place more emphasis uh, on these areas than they are today. And the ones that come at the top, again, are, are ones that we've referenced before. Uh, critical thinking and analytical reasoning, ability to analyze and solve complex problems, communication, both orally and written communication skills, and then applying knowledge and skills in real world settings. Those coming to the top is being seen as, we've seen them as critical and important to employers and more important um, than the major itself when they're evaluating applicants. And then here we see that they would like colleges to be placing more emphasis on these areas than they do today. This second chart reflects the other items that were tested. And while the dark blue bar here is smaller, again, the top two uh, majority saying when it comes to knowledge of science and technology and the ability to work with numbers and understand statistics, majority saying more emphasis should be placed there by colleges. Uh, it is worth noting that the red bar, which reflects the proportion of employers who would say, I think colleges should place less emphasis on this area, there's no area where a majority or even uh, a significant proportion want less emphasis. The highest is 22%, but nothing here. In all of these areas, they at least want colleges to maintain the level of emphasis, but they clearly are making some distinctions about where they would like to see uh, more happening um, at colleges today. This is a place where you can note the differences in the priorities that employers are placing on the acquisition of knowledge versus the acquisition and application uh, and development of skills uh, in a variety of areas. So at the bottom, knowledge of democratic institutions and values, civic knowledge, knowledge of cultural diversity in America and other countries, knowledge of US role in the world, knowledge of global issues and developments, all of those ranking among the 17 areas we tested, ranking lower. And again, not areas where they want less emphasis, but, but compared to spe especially some of the cross-cutting skills, these are not areas where there's a priority being placed on increasing emphasis. The one knowledge area where we do see a uh, majority, as I mentioned before, the knowledge of science and technology, 56%. But here's a place where you kind of see the distinctions uh, that employers are making between the acquisition of knowledge and really using the skills and, and applying knowledge and skills uh, in and showing the demonstrated capacity to do that. We also wanted to understand um, other kinds of learning goals <clears throat> and aims for college learning that go beyond preparing students for success in the workplace. And you can see here that there is broad agreement with um, a variety of these goals for college education. And in each case, the, again, these are all students regardless of their chosen field of study, uh, majority saying that, that they uh, agree um, that whether it's students should have educational experiences that teach them how to solve problems with people whose views are different from their own, coming at the top at 91%. 87%, all students should learn about ethical issues uh, relevant to their field. 86%, all students should have direct learning experiences working with others to solve problems important in their communities. Um, those three, with the uh, dark blue bar being a little longer, so the intensity there and the strong agreement a little higher. But again, in all these areas, we're seeing that there is a recognition among employers about the importance of a broad set of college learning goals. Uh, the idea of building civic capacity that all students, regardless of their chosen field of study, should take courses to help build civic capacity, 82% agree. 80% agree that all students should acquire broad knowledge in liberal arts and sciences. And 78% all students should learn about societies and cultures outside the US and global issues and developments. So again, there's this breadth of what employers 
uh, the learning outcomes that employers hope and would like to see college students achieving, recognizing that within that there are some priorities and differentiation that they do make. Uh, as I mentioned, we asked about a variety of emerging educational practices, and we wanted to understand to what degree employers think they would help in preparing college students for success after graduation. Um, what we see here is approaches that foster the development of research, whether that's um, developing the skills to research questions in their fields and, deve and develop evidence-based analysis, or which is 83% will help at least a fair amount, or expecting <coughs> students to develop the skills to conduct research collaboratively with their peers, 74% will help a fair amount, as well as uh, practices that will foster active learning. Those are also broadly endorsed by employers, um, whether that's <coughs> completing a significant project before gradu graduation, which demonstrates uh, the knowledge uh, that, that, uh, that graduates have achieved. 79% say that will help a fair amount. Completing an internship, 78% say that would help a fair amount. And acquiring hands-on experience with the methods of science to understand how knowledge, scientific knowledge is developed, 69% fair amount. Uh, so as you can see, these again get back to the idea of, of active effortful work, putting, um, putting theory and learning into practice, uh, and demonstrating the ability to do these things and to, um, to use these skills and knowledge. To that point, we asked employers uh, to what degree it would be useful to them if, in addition to having a recent graduate's resume and college transcript, there was an electronic port portfolio that would demonstrate accomplishment in key skill and knowledge areas. And 83% say that would be at least fairly, fairly useful, 43% very useful. And I think just another way uh, for employers to understand that uh, graduates are achieving a lot of the kinds of outcomes that they've been telling us are important. We asked employers the ways that they could be engaging and participating and partnering um, with the f facilitation of uh, hands-on, real-world learning and experiences. 47% of employers say that their company offers internships or apprenticeships in partnership with nearby college or university. Uh, smaller proportions say that they do the other things, whether that's working with career service office at a college, partnering to better align curriculum and learning outcomes, or sponsoring some other type of way for students to get involved in real-world learning. So smaller proportions saying that they are doing this with the dark blue bar, but the light blue bar reflects among those who aren't doing it, the proportion who say, uh, I would have uh, high or medium interest in our company participating in this way. And so even those who aren't doing it, they are, do, are expressing many of them an interest in participating and partnering in this way. I think to close, it's important, this kind of uh, will encapsulate everything that we've been seeing in terms of the priorities employers are placing and the way they're thinking about uh, the learning outcomes that are important for college <coughs> graduates in the context of the challenges that they're facing today in, in the 21st century economy. And we provided employers a description of a liberal education. We found that 95 percent say that they thought this was a, that it was very important for colleges to provide this type of education today. Um, 40, and 51% uh, said it's very important. I mean, it, if you just look at the description that we have here, you can see the various elements of the things that we've seen throughout this uh, presentation that are priorities, whether that's both broad and specific knowledge um, being acquired, whether that's developing cross-cutting intellectual and practical skills, which are clearly important, demonstrating the ability to apply knowledge and skills in the real world, and helping develop a sense of social responsibility. But not only do employers say it's important, but when you ask them if they were advising their own child or a young person that they know today about the type of college education that they should pursue to achieve professional and career success in today's economy, 74% say that they would advise uh, their child or a young person they know to pursue this type of education, this liberal education that we described. 19% said it depends, and that's a, fair, uh, that's a fair response. When we pressed those people and said, okay, but if you had to choose, what, would you choose that or not? Uh, it gets up to 89% who say they would advise a young person to pursue a li liberal education. So I think this question kind of encapsulated and is the culmination of a lot of the other findings that I've highlighted um, in illustrating that it, 
for employers today, um, there are a variety of skills and knowledge areas that are important to them. And the demonstrated capacity uh, to put those to use in real world, world settings, and particularly problem solving, critical thinking, and communication skills are all critically important. And the major, while those go well with the major and are important, the major in and of itself, or the specific field of study, is much less important than the acquisition of those skills and the ability to put them into practice in real world settings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abigail, for running through um, really interesting findings. Um, we don't have time for a question right at this moment, but I promise you we will have time for questions, and Abigail is going to be around. So if you have specific questions about um, the poll and the findings, she's here, and we will have time to take those. Um, but right now, we want to actually hear from our president and from some of the employers or some of the kinds of employers that we actually talk to. So I'm very pleased to now present to you our president, Carol Geary Schneider, who I'm pretty certain uh, does not require any introduction for this crowd. Uh, but I do want to say that um, Carol, of course, is the person who conceived of and has led our LEAP initiative since its conception. Uh, and she's going to say a bit more now about this newest part of our LEAP initiative developed by our LEAP President's Trust. So thank you, Deborah, and good morning to all of you, both the colleagues who are gathered here at the St. Regis and to all of those who have joined us on the webcast uh, that's streaming right now. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome all of you to this forum on making high-quality learning our shared priority as a nation goes to college. And I also want to thank Abigail for her splendid assistance of this effort and her, for her very cogent presentation of the findings from the new survey we've just released this morning. But now it's my real pleasure to introduce the second document that we are discussing at this forum, the new LEAP Employer Educator Compact. You can find this compact in your folios if you're sitting here in this room. Uh, and if you're streaming in, uh, you can find it on the AACNU website. As you know, quality is often praised when we talk about higher education, but it is very rarely described uh, in any useful detail. And so what this employer educator compact provides for us is a succinct description of what we really mean by quality in a 21st century educational context. It pulls together in a useful and succinct way everything that Abigail has just been talking about as she has walked us through the kinds of questions that were put to employers and the kinds of things they think are important. But it also bands employers and educators together around a shared conception of quality. The compact also describes specific actions that we can take together, employers and educators working in partnership, frankly, to push back against the broad discussion that tends to narrow what higher education is about, and to focus everyone's attention on the multiple kinds of learning that make a difference to careers and certainly to our democracy. The compact has been signed by 270 individuals, including a large number of employers who collectively represent a huge array of industries and organizations, everything from defense to energy to technology, communications, finance, manufacturing, education, and health. The signatories, in addition to those employers who will talk with us this morning, include senior leaders at Azalea Health, Boeing, Cisco Systems, J.M. Smucker, J.P. Morgan Chase, Raytheon, State Farm Insurance, Rubbermaid Corporation, Target, Teach for America, and 150 other organizations. The sheer breadth of the industries represented shows us how dependent our economy really is on the kind of learning we've just been hearing about from Abigail and that the compact describes. Leadership in developing this compact and inviting employer endorsements came, as Deborah has mentioned, from our President's Trust, a group of 100 college, university, and community college presidents who together provide guidance to AACNU's LEAP initiative. Trust members, several of whom are here this morning, some on the panel and some in the audience, work together to articulate and to promote the value of a 21st century liberal education, both for success in the economy, but also for the vitality of a globally engaged democracy. 
Uh, I'd like to recognize all the presidents uh, who are members of the trust and who are here with us today. Would those in the audience please stand up? And let us, yes, thank you. <laughs> you are doing the work of the Lord. Uh, and three other members of the trust will be speaking with us in a few minutes. You will find the full list of signatories, uh, employers, and educators in your packet and on AAC News website. But these, I want to emphasize, are the initial signers. We are launching this compact today, not finishing it. It has generated hundreds of conversations within industries and between education and uh, employers across the country. That needs to be millions of conversations. We are starting today to expand this circle. So let's start first with what the compact actually says about a high quality 21st century education. That succinct description of what we mean by quality that we're talking about. In brief, uh, the compact points our attention toward four key areas of learning that above and beyond the major, whatever the major is, students also need. And they include broad learning about science, society, technology, human diversity, global cultures, and the independence that pulls us all together as a community and as a global community. It includes intellectual skills that basically add up to competencies we need to engage in evidence-based reasoning. When we're talking about critical thinking, communication, creative thinking, quantitative fluency, information literacy, collaborative problem solving, it all comes down to, are we helping students really learn how to use evidence to make judgments and solve problems in the economy and in our democracy? The third area has to do with personal and social responsibility. Ethics is a very important theme in that uh, review of the employer views that you just heard. So too is diversity. But so also for our democracy, our civic and democratic knowledge engagement, and above all, the ability to work together productively with diverse people and with points of view that are different from our own. And finally, integrative and adaptive learning, what I like to call the 21st century liberal art, which challenges everyone to pull together knowledge, skill, and responsibility. Uh, when we're tackling new and emerging problems and complex questions. So those are the four areas of learning. They are traditionally called liberal education, but whatever we call them, the Compact and the Heart Research Survey together make it very clear that employers see this kind of learning as essential to success in the economy and to the future of our democracy. But now I want to let the employers and presidents who created this compact speak for themselves about why they endorsed it uh, and why this vision uh, is important, and above all, what they're doing to help students actually achieve it. So we are going to have two panel presentations. First, we are going to hear from four employers who are listed on your screen. Two of them are with us today in the room, uh, Michelle Toth from Northrop Grumman and Paul Grinaldo from uh, Doctors Community Hospital. We will also be joined by telephone from two employers who got up at 6 a.m. this morning <laughs> to weigh in and say, yes, we are behind this too. They are Pat, Pat Wrighton from Pacific Power and Mary Coucher from IBM. So I am going to put a single question to each of them. They're each going to be brief in their answers because we are very eager eventually to open this up to the, those in the audience. Uh, so the first question for uh, all of you, and I'm going to start with Michelle. Uh, why did your organization let you sign this um, or sign it for you? And uh, why and how is this kind of um, learning important in your particular industry? Okay. Michelle? Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everybody. Um, Northrop Grumman is a company that is very committed to providing highly technical superior solutions, both that enable in our national security and also that of our allies. And to do that, we're living in a very fast-paced world where we can't always anticipate what's next. So we really do need students that are really T-shaped. We need those that are very technically rich, and we equally need folks that are very broad in their thinking. We need not only are we need folks that are capable of solving business problems, as we heard Abigail talk about in technical. Um, solutions as well, but also those that are capable of working in teams, communicating with diverse populations, folks that are very agile and taking their technology skills and applying them in an innovative way that is forward-looking, connecting business dots, understanding fundamentals of business, and how the human capital elements play in. So we really, it's very important that as the world continues to evolve, 
that we have students and a cadre of students that are broad in their thinking and that are willing to come into the workplace and help us solve business problems by engaging with leaders at all levels and employees across various domains. It's, it's becoming more and more critical that we, we find individuals that have broad, broad skills and that are technically rich as well and passionate about what they do. Okay. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to go to uh, Pat Wrighton, uh, uh, who's speaking with us by teleconference. Pat, how would you answer the same question? Why is this kind of learning important in Pacific Power? Oh, thanks, Dr. Schneider. I appreciate the ability to participate and want to thank the association for their attention to this important priority and for organizing the compact initiative, also for including us. I have to say I was really interested in Abigail's run-through of the survey results, which really ring true for what we're seeing and what we're interested in. Uh, just for context, let me give you a brief description of Pacific Power. Along with our sister company, Rocky Mountain Power, we provide electric service to 1.8 million customers across six western states. Uh, we employ about 6,500 people. Uh, we're part of Mid-American Energy Holdings Company, which is the energy arm of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, so to start, uh, I'd, I'd say we're very pleased to sign the compact, uh, not only for what it symbolizes, but particularly what it'll do. Uh, we're really interested in a pragmatic focus on a broader range of skills in higher education, uh, a focus this compact uh, is clearly aimed at providing a focus that very much aligns with our company's view of who we'd like to hire to lead the company in the years to come. Our uh, decision to sign the compact is partly born out of our partnership with Oregon State University, which is really multidimensional. Uh, OSU is a significant customer of ours. It's also a significant institution and a provider of highly qualified technical but well-rounded business leaders right here in our state uh, in our service territory. Our existing engagement uh, academically and as a supportive funder and consumer of research uh, gives us uh, a lot of additional opportunities to carry out the compact together and advance its objectives. Uh, its president, uh, my friend Ed Ray, I think really gets what this is about, which, uh, which has really helped uh, underline our partnership. Obviously, our, our industry, the electric utility industry, is pretty complex, uh, very technical. Our company is filled with engineers, economists, statisticians, project managers, accountants, uh, other employees uh, that need a high level of technical expertise to do their jobs. But uh, by design, we're a company that relies heavily on people who can lead, who can manage people, not just processes, uh, who can communicate effectively, who can understand the relationship between the uh, uh, vast reach and impact of our business. And a, a way I like to think of that is that you know, while we're a provider of essential services, you know, we really also have to excel at customer services. Uh, we serve 243 different communities, and if we're not doing the customer service part of the business, uh, we're, we're failing. Uh, so to accomplish that, you know, our, our folks have to understand people, communities, complex policy and politics. Uh, and the relationship of those issues to the technical parts of our business. So they basically need to understand how to navigate. Uh, the LEAP, uh, LEAP and, and the Compact are really all about the skills we're increasingly looking for at Pacific Power, interpersonal skills, uh, leadership, decision-making, teamwork, uh, and the ability to communicate clearly and effectively, just to name a few at the top of the list. Uh, uh, so I, I could go on and on, but uh, I'll stop and just again thank the association uh, for the initiative uh, to help students prepare for uh, what I think is the world they'll really face after college. Thank you, Pat. And now I'm going to turn to Mary, who's also uh, calling in by telephone. Would you tell us why IBM considers this kind of learning important in your industry? Uh, good morning to everyone, and thank you, uh, Dr. Schneider, as well, and for AACNU to this uh, great initiative. We're pleased to be a part of it. Uh, much like Pat, and Pat, thank you for the power this morning, by the way. Uh, you don't sound like you just uh, got out of bed, so it's working for you very much so. Uh, we have uh, core values that um, at IBM that define um, really our working atmosphere. And briefly, they are uh, dedication to every client's success, innovation that matters for our company and for the world, 
and trust and personal responsibility in all relationships. So if I take those words and certainly uh, the indicators from the survey that were shared with us this morning and the attributes of the compact, they really mesh well together with uh, the way we uh, behave and the kinds of individuals that we consider important for our company to lead us. IBM is a company that is over now 100 years old. We are in virtually every country in the world. And so the broad mission of um, hiring, for sure, is important for us to understand how to reinvent, if you will. Uh, the company has a, a tenet to reinvent ourselves as we go along so that we're current and uh, that we make a difference in those core values. So uh, when, like Pat, when Dr. Ed Ray of Oregon State, our, our uh, president here in the great state of Oregon, asked us to join as well, it was very um, synergistic with the kinds of things that we need to help us reinvent the company and those kinds of leaders that we're looking to hire. And certainly um, Oregon State itself embodies that. Of course, we uh, engage with thousands of universities in the United States and, of course, globally. And so that um, the compact itself really has so many of those attributes that were just natural for us. Uh, there's a long list of them, and they were natural to, um, to just say yes to because we do them anyway. So with that, uh, it, was, it was just a, a good thing to sign on to, and we're very proud and honored to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Mary. And now I'm going to turn to Paul Grinaldo, um, who is with us this morning, and let him talk about all of this from the point of view of a leadership organization in health. Well, thank you. Good morning. Um, the only thing I would add, I, I agree with all the comments that are made by the other, my colleague here. Um, hosp the hospital industry is one of the most regulated uh, industries in, in the country. And so to have that ability for your workforce to think critically uh, when an inspector can walk into your own institution at any time and start asking questions and says, tell me why you treated this patient this way, it's just vital to our survival. It's, it's part of our DNA to be uh, partnered with educational institutions. It's, it's, uh, it goes back to the, the origins of hospital care that uh, they're one of the main categories of a hospital is a teaching hospital, a university-based teaching hospital. Uh, and so giving those, that work, those students the opportunity to practice before you turn them loose on society is, is vital to, to, to our survival. And when you think about it now, um, there are more critically, you have to be pretty, pretty sick to be admitted to a hospital to meet the requirements to be admitted to a hospital today. And, I'm, and when I think it's sitting in my office that I have 21, 22, 23 year old recent college graduates that are assigned six critically ill patients their ability to think critically and to make sure that we're following all the guidelines and all the regulations is, is just vital to our success. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I had told the panelists that I would put a second question to them, but I also told them that my highest goal was to actually open this up to the audience. So we have about 10 minutes left for this section. Uh, and now I'm going to invite people from the audience uh, to raise your hands and you may ask questions either of the employers have spoken, including Pat and Mary, who are, remain on the line, or of Abigail, if you had some things you're really burning to ask her about the uh, survey itself. So let's uh, take questions or comments from the audience. And uh, when you uh, stand up, please uh, tell us who you are. In fact, isn't there a mic somewhere? Yes, there's a mic. Right. We have a mic to give you. We want to be sure your questions can be heard by those who are taking part in the teleconference. Well, I'm not shy. Um, <laughs> good morning, Noah Brown. I'm president and CEO of the Association of Community College Trustees. And I guess my question comment relates both to the survey and then I'd love for the employers to kind of chime in. Uh, the data are clearly very interesting, but at least for me, were not particularly new or revolutionary. I think we've known a lot of this for a very long time. And I know many of us in the room have talked about it. Um, so I guess I'd like to hear more from the employers about what you would like college and university leaders 
to drill down on in order to make sure that we are doing the kinds of things that employers really need us to be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll start with Michelle and, and Paul. Michelle? I think really having um, a stronger partnership, I do believe there's healthy, good partnerships out there with many employers and various institutions, but I think just continuously engaging, it's not just about the dollars that industry can give or bring, but I think it's the relationship building to, so that the universities really understand what is going on in business and that business understands what's going on in the universities and just stronger partnership and, and connectivity around curriculum development and other facets that are changing so rapidly. I think that, I, I hate to keep repeating it, but it really is the relationship and it has to be ongoing. It's not just writing a check and then the company disappears. It's the relationship so that we stay in, in mutual line around what is going on both within the universities and externally so that we can adjust the curriculum quickly because we're asking these students to be agile and be able to respond to the, the needs in industry. So we need the partnership so that the universities can respond also accordingly. And, and I might just weigh in. I, when I see partnerships, they tend to be far more commonly organized between universities or community colleges or colleges uh, and their professional programs. Um, so I think one of the unaddressed issues here is the uh, relationship that the humanities and social sciences departments uh, have with uh, the kinds of industries that are represented here. And I here. think it's with the, the faculties, you know, with the employers mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. and uh, across all the things right. as you mentioned, right. certainly the liberal mm -hmm. arts. Yes, and and I, I, to expand on the, the curriculum development um, point that you made, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think that if there was a way to get um, in, in our industry, business leaders to be part of that curriculum development, to actually sit down and have those dialogues to say, okay, this is what we're planning to offer this semester. What do you think about this? Okay. And to really have that kind of exchange, I think, would be, would be uh, very powerful. Pat and Mary, do you want to weigh in on this? Are there, uh, the question has to do with how we can drill down farther uh, so that we're not just endorsing certain kinds of capacities on the part of students, but what, what can we do to actually help students get these? Yeah, I, I have one comment, um, Carol, that might be slightly different, and that is um, I, I see the institutions readily engaging with alum that are a little bit more mature, more senior, if you will. Maybe it's because of the tax bracket they're in. But <laughs> if you can grab the young alum right out of college, right when they, they leave you, um, it, their insight is so relevant. Um, they want to help. They just haven't been asked. Mm -hmm. So if you can ask them, whether it's at a community college level or, uh, you know, right straight out of, of school, they will volunteer if asked. I'm, I'm confident of it. And if, mm -hmm. and if you can get them hooked, they will be so insightful for what to do, where the faults and failings might be, and it's very, very relevant. Pat? You know, I'd, I'd weigh in. Those, those are all excellent comments, and I, uh, I agree with them, all, all of them. Uh, and uh, I, I would just say, you know, that there are some obvious things. You know, have, having business folks serve on working groups or advisory boards uh, is, is an obvious good way to create more feedback to help uh, guide uh, uh, universities and community colleges. And that, that uh, that goes both ways. I know I appreciate the job you're doing on behalf of community colleges and would just note uh, uh, we have Steve Van Osdell of uh, Walla Walla Community College serving actually on my advisory board which creates a great uh, interaction. And we also can connect our recruitment and HR people to the, uh, to the schools to communicate on a fire, finer level what we're uh, uh, working, looking for as we hire and uh, I, I think we do a reasonable job of funneling people into the technical areas of our company, particularly through the engineering department, uh, through internships, uh, but probably can do a better job emphasizing back uh, to you all what additional skills we're looking for beyond the, uh, uh, the technical, which we're uh, committing to now through this partnership. All right. Th thank you. There's somebody in the middle of the room who has your hand up. Um, I hope we can get a mic to you and tell us who you are.
Hi, I'm Julia Brookins with the American Historical Association. I was wondering, um, we hear sometimes from employers, because we're also trying to work on these types of partnerships, um, that the higher level people within companies are very aware of the broad range of skills and understandings that they want their employees to have, but that the bottleneck, um, a preference towards more vocational or professional certificate programs is actually in the human resources and lower down. So how, I I'm, I'm guess I'm wondering, within your organizations and companies, how far down the ladder do you think this understanding trickles? I'm going to put this one directly to you, uh, Michelle, because you are in human resources. And, and she's raising a question we hear constantly, that senior level people see the point of broad learning and make a case for it. But down in the recruiting station, a wholly different message is being carried to campuses. Actually, I'll respond in the context of our hiring managers. And I have been fortunate to be at various um, different parts of Northrop Grumman. And what I've seen actually is the hiring managers are the ones that really want folks coming out of colleges that are broader because much of their work that needs to get done is performed in teams and works across disciplines. So they certainly need people that can collaborate, you know, can connect dots rather if they're coming in as a software engineer but working with finance to help them solve their problem or working with HR or our strategy organization. So within Birth of Grumman, what I see really is more the need in the hiring manager lower down in the organization. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our higher level folks are the ones that want the real specific technical folks because that's the way they came up the chain. Mm -hmm. So I actually see the, the opposite mm -hmm. in our company. Well, I hope we can make what you're saying about your company real for uh, all the companies that have signed <laughs> for this, because I, I think this is a shared uh, uh, concern uh, across higher education. And it strikes me that one of the findings of the survey, uh, that employers are increasingly interested in e-portfolios, becomes a way um, of making visible students' actual experience with integrating and applying their learning in just the kind of collaborative problem solving you're talking about. Students can put up videos of things they did as internships or in their service learning activities. We can get a lot more interested in what their research projects really are. So I think there's lots of ways that we can do if this. If I could yeah. make one additional comment, maybe engaging, when you're engaging with partnerships, is asking and inviting in the lower level leaders to come in. I know when we go on campus, we intentionally send lower level um, hiring managers mm -hmm. to engage because they are the ones that are sharing and departing that kind of information. And Paul, I see you nodding. Do you do that as well? I agree. And I think that one of the challenges for us is um, you'll have that manager who says, I, I have this work that I need to get done. And at the same time, we, we at the leadership level have this vision of how we're, we're trying to create these opportunities, um, connecting the dots for them. And sometimes it just, it just takes sitting down and having that conversation and, and connecting the dots as to why that's important to our future and how it's going to benefit them. But you have to make those, those connections Those for connections, them. exactly. OK. Uh, well, we have come to the end of our time for this panel. I'm going to ask our employers to stay here as we move to the next panel. But please uh, join me in a round of appreciation for all of them. And, uh, And special thanks to the 6 a.m. club. Uh, we are very much in your debt. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, so the key question really is not what kind of learning we want our students to leave college with and why it matters, but how, what we're actually doing to help our students achieve this kind of learning. Not just students in some programs, not just students in some <laughs> institutions. We're talking about a version of liberal learning that applies to all students in all degree programs, in all sectors of Amer American higher education. So we are going to hear now from three uh, key leaders who represent the breadth of those sectors. Uh, Millie Garcia from Cal State University Fullerton, Charlene Dukes, who's president of Prince George's Community College, Ken Ruscio from Washington and Lee in Virginia. Uh, all three are members of the AACNU Board of Directors. Uh, and uh, Millie is, in fact, the chair of the Board of Directors this year. So I have asked each of them to talk briefly uh, with you and with one another about how they're going to use this compact. We have, as, as Noah said, this isn't new evidence about what employers are looking for, but I assure you it's findings that students rarely know about. I go to lots of campuses and students are always surprised 
to hear that it's not just your major that matters. So uh, I'm going to start with Millie. Uh, how do you envision using this, especially with the many first-generation students who are your population? At yes, Kelsey? let me begin by saying that I'm going to concentrate on service learning and community service since we've talked about internships already. You should know at Fullerton we have 38,000 students, 55% are first-generation college students. We are also a Hispanic-serving institution as well as an Asian Pacific Islander institution. And we are one of only six public universities in the top 10 who have been recognized for community service participation and service learning. So I wanted to provide some examples of how we're doing this in all of our colleges in connection, in partnership with student affairs, because it is one of our goals that all of our students engage in some type of community service and service learning. So just to give you a couple examples, since we have limited time, let me begin by speaking about the Health Sciences Department in the College of Health and Human Services, where they recently instituted a graduation requirement of 120 hours for their majors focused on community engagement and service learning. These tracks that I'm going to tell you about were developed by speaking to employers in their areas in order to make sure that they're connecting with the, what they're learning and what they're bringing into the community. And those tracks include health promotion and disease prevention, global health, environmental and occupational health and safety in communities, and they, the students will pick from these options in order to be engaged, and it's part of their graduation requirement. The College of Education is also doing something which is really exciting. It's an ongoing relationship and partnership with the city of Maywood. The Maywood project explores the development of, co of a college-going culture in a city that has been historically of overlooked and under-resourced, is largely Latino, low-income community, with a large percentage of undocumented residents. Four percent of that community have received some sort of college degree. And students are engaged in the creation, implementation, and evaluation of an educational fair that includes employers that reach across broad segments of Maywood, including employers so students can see the possibility, and including alums coming from those areas. In 2012, we had over 600 residents of the community attending this kind of fair. And also in the College of Engineering and Computer Science, a society of Mexican-American engineers and scientists are comprised of undergraduate students who have just finished their second annual fair for the STEM disciplines. That is geared towards undergraduate high school students and parents to promote STEM fields. The high school students prepare these workshops in consultation with employers and faculty. They have these workshops, have students attend, but they also have parents attend these workshops and also have parents understand the importance of financial aid, how to get into the university, what are the requirements of a four-year university. And we give out a poster that's done by the Cal State system, how to get to college, starting with the sixth grade, telling parents in every year how to get through college. And finally, they do it in multiple languages. So this is given out to all of the parents. And then in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, I'll end with that one, we're in the sixth year of what we call the DC Scholars, where students from all disciplines have an opportunity to work with elected officials, federal agencies, nonprofit organizations such as the National Coalition for the Homeless, and lobbying firms. And the goal is for students to learn about our democratic and civic society in action. You should know I met these students last fall uh, for the first time. I'm new at Fullerton. And when I spoke to these students, for many of them it was the first time they ever took an airline flight, first time going out to California, first time understanding the weather in, uh, in, in um, D.C. and getting on the metro. And they said they're even loving living in D.C. and want to stay in D.C. And how do they get to network and asking advice? How to network in order to stay in D.C. to be engaged in civic and democratic society. And I'll end there. All right, great. Because I could keep going. <laughs> Charlene. Well, uh, good morning, and, and thank you all for being here. And certainly thank you, Carol, and AAC, and you for having us here to engage in this discussion. Uh, our mission at Prince George's Community College in Largo, Maryland is simple. It's to transform the lives of the more than 44,000 students that we serve on an annual basis. Uh, much like you heard uh, Millie describe, uh, we are 93% students of color, 
Uh, we are identified as a predominantly black institution. Uh, we are an achieving the dream institution. 80% of our students work at least 20 hours or more. We have moved from an institution that probably 10 years ago had a total financial aid program of about 12, 13 million dollars, and this year we awarded more than 50 million dollars in financial aid. So that also tells you a lot about the changing economic situation in our community. And one of the things that I wanted to focus on, because we do similar things that, that Millie has talked about, but what's really happening in terms of how we engage our faculty and staff in discussions about the need for these critical capacities and then how those capacities then find their, their way into our curriculum, into the dialogues that we have with students and the faculty to faculty dialogues, department to department, division to division, and then with our employer advisory boards. Because many of us have advisory boards where we do just like Paul indicated, we're talking to them about what's cross-cutting and what's new in curriculum. What do we need to be thinking about uh, as we're educating students today for the jobs that are out there tomorrow? And I'm believing as we've been sitting here talking and, and that we have made a commitment to this uh, LEAP Employer Educator Project that we really need to rethink the work of our advisory boards. That uh, they don't just need to come in once a quarter and talk uh, for a few moments about some things that they believe that are on the horizon, but they really need to work with us hand in hand. Not just in developing curriculum, but being guest lecturers. Ensuring that uh, when our students are in internship or job shadowing opportunities, that they actually are getting experiences that speak to these capacities. That quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, that they're not sitting there cleaning out the storage room, that they're not filing, and they're not doing those things that those people who are regularly working on those jobs have said, I know I've needed to do this for six months, and yay, I have an intern who can make this happen for me. But really, are they working in groups and teams? Do they understand the innovation that's needed? And how can we partner, I believe, as Michelle has indicated, in key and serious and critical ways with employers to help us give students those experiences while they're still in school? And that, that to me, is, is what, what is important. I think all of us in higher education want to ensure that our students are indeed work ready with this broad array, of, broad array of knowledge and skills that we're talking about today and that they're making meaningful, meaningful contributions in the workplace sooner rather than later. But I think that we have to get students there today. For our students, uh, you know, I laugh because I, I park in the, my space every day <laughs> and students are walking across the lot from the uh, bus stop and they all have plugs in their ears. And I'm saying, good morning, how are you? Hope you have a great day. And they're looking straight ahead with their <laughs> plugs in their ears. So how do we really use technology to help them with this? And I think when, when Carol and I talked about this, I said we should develop an app with these cross-cutting skills on it and that some kind of way students are being sent tweets or messages every day that says, you know, are you engaged in this kind of way? What kind of teamwork were you engaged in today? What did you learn from it? What was the problem that you solved? How can you apply that in your personal life and in your academic life? And what are the implications for your work life? And that's what we really have to do. We have to talk to young people about what the expectations are and then hold them accountable for them. Right. I, I told Charlene that it's been my dream for some time to get employers' voices into the students' iPads. This is the first practical <laughs> translation of that I've heard. I see you both nodding. I'm going to let you talk to each other about it in a couple of minutes. But let's hear from uh, Ken first. Thanks, Carol. I, I want to uh, take a slightly different tack this morning. Uh, we've been talking about what employers want, which is appropriate. But what I want to talk about for uh, a couple of minutes is really what I think our students need in order to respond to uh, the employer's expectations. Uh, Washington and Lee, in some ways, is um, a traditional liberal arts college. We have about 1,800 undergraduate students and about 300, 400 law students. Um, but in a way, our, our tradition, because we are a traditional liberal arts college, is actually academic innovation. So I want to just mention briefly three programs that we uh, consider innovative in the context of what we're talking about this morning, but then really step back and look at 
uh, a couple of observations I have about the kind of students who are coming our way and their strengths and their weaknesses and how we can um, improve upon uh, some of the weaknesses that they bring to us. Um, the three programs I wanted to mention, which are very much in line with uh, what we've been talking about, one is the Shepherd Poverty Program, uh, named after uh, alumnus and trustee Tom Shepherd. Um, the other is the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics, named after uh, alumnus Roger Mudd, who gave us a nice contribution to develop the Center for Ethics. And the third is the As Yet Unnamed Entrepreneurship Program. Um, the college president reflex in me causes me to point out at this moment that that's a naming opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, the Shepherd program, however, is, is a, a program where we take um, students, we give them a very intensive interdisciplinary course in poverty, its causes, uh, how it had its historical uh, perspective, um, sociological, statistical, all the, the nuts and bolts. But then for the summer, we put them in uh, a carefully designed placement whether it's in uh, rural poverty, urban poverty, um, outside the country, to spend those two or three months kind of seeing and, and experiencing uh, what that is actually like. And then they come back again and, and take that experience and integrate it uh, more fully <coughs> into an academic course. Um, the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics, among the things that it, it does is uh, it offers courses in professional ethics interdisciplinary courses, not uh, embracing humanities as well as the professions. And the capstone experience for that course is a weekend uh, symposium where employers come in, alumni, and present case studies to the group of students. So the, the, the alumni, the lawyers, the doctors, the business uh, persons, the journalists, will talk about the experience they had with this ethical problem they face and challenge the students, and then the students will in turn challenge them based on the course that they've had. The entrepreneurship program is very much in line with what we were talking about here, where students develop business plans, they develop their company, their proposal, and then entrepreneurs and employers come in, judge those proposals, critique them, and students know that they have to kind of get outside that classroom experience to talk the language of, of entrepreneurs and employers. But I, I guess all of that is real, those are really just representative types of programs. But what I want to make mention just quickly are two observations about the kind of students we get now. Not just, this is not just apply to first generation mm -hmm. students, but also to second, third, and fourth, and maybe even more to second, third, and fourth generation than first. First of all, th this is a student generation that is, on the one hand, well, I, I think there are students who are the most connected, but have lost the ability to make connections. Mm -hmm. When I um, was teaching about you know, 15 or 20 years ago, I would write things on term papers like, uh, you have a great idea, you argue with great passion, however you have no evidence or data to back up your points. <laughs> now it's completely reversed. They have great graphics, they have great data, they have all kinds of statistics, but they have no argument or thesis to support it. They can't make sense of that whole. And so one of, one of the things that I think we find is that they, they are um, unfocused because, not just because of the technology, but because of just the flood of things that, that comes in right now. I think the other thing that I noticed about this generation of college students, and think about, at least for the traditional college age student, they, they, how they grew up. Uh, one of their first memories, of course, is 9-11. Then after that comes a series of wars. Then comes economic collapse, just as they're beginning to think about college. This has been a pretty rough road <laughs> for the current generation of college students. One of the ways that I think that they're reacting to it is through a fair amount of anxiety, <coughs> defensiveness, mm -hmm. risk aversion, and just at the time when we need to kind of expand their horizons, um, expand their confidence, expand their ability to uh, address problems in a very, very comprehensive way. They seem to be focused in very short term and in very, very narrow and particularistic kinds of ways, understandably. But rather than, for colleges and universities, rather than to kind of um, 
react to that um, and, and just sort of uh, succumb to it, um, I think it is incumbent upon us to, to be much more aggressive in uh, directing that and, and reshaping that in our program. So, you know, as I think about the things that we're talking about this morning, as I think about the things that we're doing in Washington Way, it's not just what we teach, um, but it's how we teach and how we begin to adjust in certain ways given the reality of uh, the, the profile of college students that we face right now. Great. Thank you very much uh, for those three presentations. Uh, we miraculously have five minutes left. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have seen the people on the panel kind of leaning in, nodding at one another. So I wondered if you just want to ask some questions or make some comments of one another uh, to, uh, to respond to the things you've been hearing one another say. I, in talking about first generation, what Ken just spoke about, in addition to all of that, first generation and low income students have also been de dealing with this recession, seeing their parents and family members losing homes, being unemployed, the struggle and anxiety of, of living, and at the same time trying to have an education. And you know, there may be ways that this compact can help us with those kinds of things too because I do think that we are responsible for instilling a sense of hope in uh, the students uh, whom we serve and they should expect that when they come to uh, our doors and, and engage within our walls. But I think that we also have to figure out ways to get into the community more and to be more of service to those communities quite frankly who support us. Uh, and I'm not just talking about business industry, but I'm talking, um, you know, nonprofit organizations, county governments, uh, civic associations. So I, I think we go back to how do we make sure that students have this, this broad array, array of skills and knowledge, but also how do we keep instilling in them this sense of commitment to community and uh, quality of life and uh, ensuring that there is vitality and viability beyond tomorrow. Just uh, go back to what some of the reporters were saying so well, and and, and, and I think there's um, there's kind of a translation process that we as college presidents um, it's incumbent upon us to really uh, uh, bring a definition and clarity to what we mean, what what something like integrative thinking means. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a cliche for us. Uh, I think employers certainly know what it means. But how, how is it um, for our college students today that they don't know what integrative thinking actually is? Um, you know, when I, again, when I think about the fact that they're uh, connected but can't make connections, well, that's what I mean by we need integrative thinking. We need um, our students to be doing that. So, you know, if we could enter into this morning a conspiracy with the employers to uh, <laughs> help us uh, translate that for these college students, that would be great. So how about that, Michelle and Paul? Are you ready to enter a conspiracy too? <laughs> I don't know so much about uh, calling it a conspiracy, but I'm even thinking in terms of just on a very real uh, basis for me. I have three kids in college right now, and and I and while most of the time I'm I'm kind of engrossed with how am I going to continue to pay for all this, <laughs> and I know that that's but and I think unfortunately that that's kind of the rap that colleges get is that my gosh it costs so much money. But I have I do have to say that my experience. And seeing what those institutions have done for my children when they come back, there's a marked change, and it's not that, and they're not disconnected with us. But I mean, I see it with, I, I see your point clearly because we do wonder sometimes how are we going to make those connections with nursing students to say, okay, this is the way you're programmed to think and act, and we need you to show some compassion here as you're dealing with these human beings in in in, in the course of your work. So, I, so I think there's this has been helpful to me on a personal level, just, and I know that. Dr. Dukes and I, we ser she serves on our board, so we have a lot of discussions about what each other does. And I think that the more we can engage in these types of discussions, the better off we're all going to be. It's going to it's going to help all of us. And I think it, you both, uh, all three of you, touched on it. I mean, we are just living in this world that's just going to constantly keep changing. And I think what you're saying, we see it in industry when we hire new college grads. I mean. They are bringing the remnants of what they've experienced, whether it's 9-11 or the, their families. I mean, they, many of them had parents who worked really hard, tons of hours over time, and then have lost their homes. So they're like, what's in it for me? 
going forward. So I think the more we can impress and partner around, it is dynamic, you know, focus on what they need to do, be agile, not live in a black and white world, but one that's more gray and that constantly morphs and changes. And that we're, and they see that there is a partnership with the universities and industry. The better off I think we'll be too. Great. Well, thank all of you very much. Um, we are, uh, I think, all inspired by the uh, range of ideas and commitments that you've put before us. Uh, please join me in, in thanking our panelists.